Welcome everyone, Costine here with a discussion about Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires. And in this video, I want to talk about the most unique and interesting campaigns that currently exist in the game as is. Not campaigns that just play like everyone else, but campaigns that have very different mechanics that you might find elsewhere and make for a fairly compelling gameplay experience. For some, not for everyone. It's not going to be for everyone, but there's some really good stuff in there. Now, generally, when it comes to these kind of lists, I do impose a limit of one legendary lord, one faction per race, or one legendary lord per faction. Like, if I'm talking about which are the best legendary lords, I'm only going to mention one from the Warriors of Cast because I don't want the entire video to be like, these are the top five legendary lords, all of them Warriors of Cast. No, a bit more variety does help. But I'm going to deviate from this role in this video because... Even within a single race, single faction, there can be some fairly uh, interesting stuff and some major changes between one legendary lord to another. So anyway, let's get started. Now at number 5, we have the Sisters of Twilight. Though, to be quite honest with you, any of the Wood Elven factions, any of the Wood Elven legendary lords would make the cut on this list. Though I feel the uh, Sisters of Twilight are certainly the most interesting of the Wood Elven factions, that's because of two things. First off is the Forge of Daith, which gives you some incredibly powerful items like Dragon Mask, Refined Dragon Mask, like you can make some really, really good stuff for them that will give you significant bonuses in your campaign, like upkeep, campaign movement range, all that. The second reason I put uh, the Sisters of Twilight at the top of the Wood Elves would also be their faction benefit. They get basically a cruise missile for uh, their Hawk Riders. And what that means is that as uh, playing as the Sisters of Twilight, you can certainly make a Doom stack of Hawk Riders work incredibly well, which is not something that you might be able to do with other legendary lords of the Wood Elves. But that's not why they're on this list. It's the Wood Elven mechanics, the specific mechanics of the Wood Elves themselves that put them on this list. See, the Wood Elves have the Deep Root. The Deep Root is basically a worldwide annul that they can access. You will start in uh, your star location, so Aphaloran or the Witchwood, or if you're playing as Draka in Ostermark, and you'll have to fight some battles there. But once you do, you'll be able to use the Deep Roots and go around the world. Go to Ulfwan, go to, um, go to the Oak of Ages, go into the Dwarven Lands, go into Cathay, or go to close to Cafe, fight across the entire world, go to the Southlands as well. Quite a lot of choices. Like you can play as a Wood Elf, as any Wood Elven Legendary Lord, you can play a campaign across the entire world. And that adds a very interesting, that, that creates uh, Legendary Lords that are more interesting to play than others. Because you can have a very uh, you can have a new campaign, basically, every single time you start, regardless of the Legendary Lord you picked. So you can do this as Orion, you can do it as Durfu, you can do it as Draka, you can do it as the Sisters of Twilight. So you do have incredible flexibility with every single Legendary Lord. Beyond that, there's also how the Wood Elves work in general as, as a faction, or as a race. The Wood Elves are very defense-oriented on the campaign map. Not in terms of siege battles, their defenses kind of suck, but in terms of how their campaign actually functions. What you need to do in order to win the campaign, like if we look at the victory conditions, all you need to do is, like, yeah, you have to loot, raise, or sank a lot of different settlements, but more importantly, you need to do the ritual re rebirth. Basically, you need to get this tree to the highest possible level, uh, with not with its uh, settlements, uh, not with the tier, but with this meter. Now, to get this meter up to full, you need to do a bunch of rituals. But the, you need to do the rituals in the smaller tree. So, regardless of how you're playing the Wood Elves, you are going to play around the world. You're not just going to, oh, I start in a certain location and I'm just going to stick around there, like most campaigns would be. You're going to start in the initial location, you're going to conquer some territories to get the meter up in a local tree, and then you're gonna go to, and that's going to affect the big tree, get faction-wide benefits, but then you're gonna need to go in other parts of the world. Likely you're gonna end up in Aphalaren, regardless, but you are going to be playing a campaign across the world. The way it works is each tree, each minor tree, except the ones in Aphalaren, 
have settlements associated with them, right? A forest associated with them. And, you're, and in order to regrow them, you need to either take or raise the settlements or give them to an ally uh, and get um, uh, and start getting life uh, into that tree. And then once you get to 100, you can conduct a ritual that will... Um, that will, that will affect the uh, Oak of Ages and Athel Lauren. So, as the Wolf Elves, it's not just an option that you're going to play a campaign across the world. It's pretty much mandatory that you're going to play across the world. You don't need an enormous number of trees to win. It probably would be like something like four or two or three even in order to do it. Just get two or three of these rituals, get some growth in the Oak of Ages, and you will win the campaign. And it is a pretty interesting campaign it's a dynamic campaign you do have a lot of flexibility chances are you're likely going to end up dealing with things in Athel Lauren because you just want to stabilize the situation there um, but after that you have the entire world available you have trees across uh, the globe pretty much in every single major geographic area of the map and that makes every single campaign that you can play interesting it's a bit too easy, I admit. It can be a bit too easy. Uh, you're not necessarily dealing with conquering a vast empire across the world. You're just dealing with local troubles around the trees. But yeah, it's certainly unique and it can certainly be very interesting. Not fighting an offensive oriented campaigns like pretty much every single other, but playing a defensive oriented campaign. Something that I wish Creative Assembly would do for more campaigns in this game or their games in general. Now, at number four, we have Scarbrand the Exiled, the greater demon of corn. The demons of corn. All the demonic factions in the game, as far as I see it, are pretty bad. Their economy is bad, their mechanics, uh, their faction mechanics don't necessarily work. But Scarbrand is, of all of the demon factions, probably the most interesting. Some people would say Kairos. Yeah, I don't really like Kairos. I've tried playing him multiple times, I don't like his army. Uh, Scarbrand works incredibly well, especially now that melee has been buffed and ranged has been nerfed. So yeah, a melee doomstack, melee doomstack works pretty, pretty well. How does he function and what makes him interesting? Well, most factions would, you know, take settlements, uh, expand across them, get buildings. If you try and do that as Scarbrand, you're just going to end up losing because his buildings, yeah, if you get a lot of them together they can end up uh, getting you a significant economic bonus, but by and large, when you're playing Scarbrand, you're going to be relying on looting and sacking enemy settlements in order to grow your income. You're going to gain a lot of money uh, by doing so. So that is that's something that does apply to other legendary lords. But what changes for Scarbrand is that he doesn't necessarily care about having much territory because he can certainly sustain himself through looting and pillaging, though having some territory to sustain his main army is going to be important. He's one of the few factions in the game where, have, where you can just genuinely have only one proper army and you will be able to beat the campaign. That's because as a faction, so to speak, uh, you gain movement range after raising a settlement. And in point of fact, you pretty much need to raise settlements because occupying them costs your, uh, your unique uh, resource which is skulls and it takes about 2500 to take a settlement i only have i have just less than 2000 i wouldn't even be able to take a settlement here you can raise a settlement and as long as you hold the provincial capital so in here i hold black rag if i raise it there is a research you can it's probably the first you should get which gives you a chance uh plus five percent chance i mean there's already a chance by default i believe but increases that to automatically colonize ruined regions in a province. Now, this is going to have some problems um, in that actions taking over the settlements in a province means you can't colonize them yourself, so there, it, there's certainly frustration with that. Uh, but crucially, Scarbrand can destroy everything in his path, and then he'll gain those territories anyway. That is uh, quite a bit of fun. Uh, but there's more to it than that. Scarbrand himself... It's not necessarily uh, shown in... Well, it is shown here. He can also replenish in foreign territory. So he can move around the map and replenish over there. And after winning a battle, you gain campaign movement range plus 25%. So that is quite a bit. He's also a powerhouse. Like, he also increases this by 15% more with his special skill tree. So he's getting, what, 40%? Uh, if he raises a settlement... 
uh, he's you're looking at 55 percent of movement range being regenerated so if I fight the battle here and auto resolve it okay and I raise the settlement there are two options one gives you skulls another gives you a blood host if I do that his movement range has pretty much regenerated to full there's more to it than that you spend the way you spend winds of magic like, Winds of Magic have the impact of giving a campaign movement range, right? So you spend movement ran uh, m Winds of Magic but to move into encamp stance, and you're gonna, you're, you can replenish in enemy territory, so, and you can recruit pretty quickly. Like, I can recruit all the units that I have currently available, mainly Bloodletters and some Chaos Warriors and Marauders of Corn. I can recruit that in foreign territory, or ruined territory for uh, that matter. So that's a pretty big deal, and it incentivizes you as a player to go from battle to battle to battle. You can also, if you sack a settlement and then raise it the turn after, you can gain an enormous amount of money. Though you're already going to have a lot of money post-battle loot. You also have uh, uh, Unholy Mass Manifestation to increase that movement range uh, for one turn, like just replenish it basically. And then when you raise this element, you can either gain skulls, or you'll always gain skulls fight by fighting a battle, or summon a blood host. Now, blood hosts are temporary armies. Their strength depends on skills, like Scarbrand at the end of his skill tree increases uh, the size of the blood host by three units. Now, this is a real army. It will cost upkeep, it's not free. Uh, but you can have some really high tier units. Like, for instance, here there's a Blood First, there's, there's Spawn of Corn, there's Blood Crushers of Corn, and Blood Letters of Corn, as well as Blood Shrines of Corn and Skull Cannon. This is a really good army. And I, and you can upgrade it even further uh, with, uh, with research. There's quite a bit of research uh, that you do have uh, available, though I'm not sure where. Like, I think there is absolutely some research that is going to increase. Um, the size of blood hosts like uh, or increase the duration of how long they have because these blood hosts will start taking attrition if they don't fight battles like when you summon one with scarbrand it's four turns you can increase that you can increase the size of the blood hosts with research with skill trees uh, you can't replenish however the with the blood host like these units once they're damaged unless you're talking about the post battle option to uh, replenish some units. Outside of that, that's the only way you can replenish them. They will not replenish by default. They're meant to be disposable armies. They're gonna cost a lot to maintain, but they can also be uh, really, really powerful. And you can go from battle to battle to battle, raising settlements in your way, and gaining a lot of these blood hosts and just unleash the tide of death on your enemy. Is it the campaign I particularly enjoy? Not really. I find it pretty tedious, but then again I find the battles currently in Total War, Warhammer 3 pretty tedious as well. I much prefer the campaign thing. Scarbrand is really focused on battles, like that's his goal of a campaign. If you're playing Scarbrand you're going to be fighting a lot of battles because the auto-resolve is going to punish you needlessly, like for instance here, if I had fought this battle on my own I would have taken significantly fewer casualties than I ended up taking over there by auto-resolving it. Um, and especially important, the blood uh, blood host, because you can't replenish them, so you want to minimize casualties. So if you're playing Scarbrand, do get used to the idea that you're going to be fighting a lot of battles on your own. Siege battles, minor settlement battles, major battles, uh, you're going to be fighting that. It isn't my favorite campaign style, but it's certainly unique and interesting in its own way compared to everything else that is in the game. And number three, there is Frat Done Clean. He's a Skaven Legendary Lord that's focused on monstrous units. That already would be interesting, as opposed to the weapon teams that someone like Ica Claw focuses on, or the ninjas of uh, Snitch, but it goes even further, much, much further uh, that. His faction bonuses and Legendary Lord bonuses don't seem all that much. I mean, yeah, he gets some benefits to monstrous units and upkeep benefits to that, but it's not that which sets Fraught apart and makes his campaign interesting. What's it apart is this meter right here. Basically, whenever you fight and win a battle, you get growth juice. Growth juice fills up in a meter. Once this meter fills up, or you flush it at certain points, you can then get mutagens. You can get mutagens and use them in the laboratory. You can upgrade the lab, get some mutagens for free, get casualty replenishment for monstrous units, all that. Like, you're really focused on that. Get various benefits to 
growth VAT units. So whenever the VATs get full, you, you're going to get some free units, pretty much. The more you fill it up before you flush the tank, so to speak, the better units you're, you'll get. So you can get things like a Brood Horror or Rat Ogres or a Hell Pit Abomination. I believe I do have one somewhere around here. Uh, no, uh, yeah, a Hell Pit Abomination. You can get this for free in your army. Okay, that's already interesting enough, but he goes further. Because if we look at the lab, every single or the vast majority of unit types like infantry, uh, infantry or monsters, mainly, they're going to have augments. Basically, you take the mutagen you've gained from the growth fat when you flush them, and you can take a unit and decide, you know what? I want to improve that unit. And you have a bunch of upgrades, different upgrades that you can get. You can get some random ones. Um, so, for instance, I take these wolf rats, right? And you don't start with all of this unlocked. You need, like, this is a tree. You need to unlock these things. Like, for instance, if I want to unlock, unlock that, I would have to get uh, cellular instability and mammoth skin cloning. Okay, so I need to get both of these. But I would get quite a bit from that. So, uh, But you do unlock stuff. So, for instance, the autonomy one, or not the autonomy one, this one would give me two uncommon augments. So I get that, you get the Guardian and melee attack, and then you can get more, you can get a bunch of random ones. You can make units into very interesting stuff uh, around the board. So for instance, over here, I would need some more mutagen. I'm just going to go purchase that, I believe. Yep. Right. And apply more. And suddenly, it is incredibly powerful. But of course, there is a downside to this. This unit will not replenish right now. Its casualty repl well, its casualty replenishment went down by 100%. But it's gained some incredible buffs, but it's also going to take a lot of damage because of the instability effects. So units can be really good or really, really bad. Like this unit, which has four augments, is in a really good state. These are togers. Those rat wolves, yeah, I just kind of dicked around with them more or less. You can make each individual unit in an army, pretty much, unique. When you, with a unique role, unique upgrades, uh, unique purpose. You can get Skaven Slaves, which are the worst unit in the game, and make them overpowered. You can take rat, uh, rat wolves, wolf rats, and make them incredibly strong. There is a downside, there is an element of RNG in it. But you do still have your baseline army, which is still pretty good. And you can get free units, so you can get become a real wrecking ball. Like getting a Hellpit Abomination on turn 21 is pretty strong. Um, and then you can make a really unique and interesting and powerful army beyond that. Which, when you add it all up, you end up with a great deal of... Uh, with a great and varied army composition across your entire faction. There is obviously the limit of mutagen in this. You won't just be able to do it on... 10 different stacks very easily um, though that certainly would be possible eventually but you won't be able to do it easily but the option is there and having that variety in an army having free units having a focus on monstrous units like Frot is a swarm faction really like people have described him that like he just swarms his enemies with overpowered monstrous units that are significantly strong that already by default are pretty good and he has bonuses towards that but he just makes them incredibly overpowered like, for instance, this um, Brood Horror, which is a good unit by default, it's got quite a lot of charge bonus, bonus of instant infantry, vanguard deployment, and some other 20% weapon, weapon strength. At only the cost of 5 melee attack, this is a good augment, a really, really good uh, augment. Some that are less good, but still gain a lot. Like, yeah, weapon strength, melee attack, charge bonus, physical resistance. There's quite a lot of things to like, and the variety really uh, makes this work and makes this uh, interesting and compelling camp campaign to play. It's one of the better campaigns out there. It is a horrible start, though, to be clear, because Hell Pit starts at level 1, and you do start at War with Kislev, which doesn't have the best elements to take, at least not in Troll Country and well, the Western Oblast. But yeah, there's a lot on offer with Frot, uh, and they did really put a lot of effort into trying to make a melee-focused uh, Skaven faction work very well, and they did with him, or a monstrous um, focus uh, Skaven faction, and they really did that with Frot. And number two is Deathmaster Snitch, who plays significantly different than Clan Mulder does. Actually, pretty much all of the legendary lords play or the DLC legendary lords play very differently than 
one another. The default ones, yeah, they play similarly, but the legendary ones, very different. Uh, Clan Eshin is focused on the self units, Knight Runners, Gutter Runners, etc. Um, and they do pay more, significantly more, twice the cost for all non Eshin units. So, hey, you want to play Claw? You're gonna have to pay for that. It's going to cost you quite a significant amount of money uh, if you want to get that. Like, for instance, 5,000 if I were to recruit it through global recruitment. That is absurd, absolutely. But here's the thing with Zinich. There are two mechanics that he does have. They're all basically uh, dealing in shadowy dealings. You have Eshin actions and you have clan contracts. Eshin actions are basically actions you can take on the campaign map to gain certain advantages. G get vision, cause rebellion, grant an ancillary, uh, steal money, and you can get even better ones. But it goes even further. Plunge into Anarchy is a really good one because uh, he can eliminate, completely eliminate a faction leader, including legendary lords, and basically remove a faction from the game. Remove. Uh, lord from the game and that applies to legendary lords obviously giving you a significant amount of power uh, in on a campaign Ma can make certainly things interesting when let's say a faction has gotten really powerful and then you just eliminate the guy in charge and they they just plunge plunge into anarchy this is really nice and these actions will remove snitch or the agent you're using for them uh, from the campaign map uh, when you're dealing with them and when you're dealing them i also believe that they will level the unit uh, the lord or hero that you are using for it so if you're playing clan Eshin, you're building a roster of heroes and lords that you're not using on the campaign uh, but ones that will give you an advantage so for instance if i send this assassin over here to engage into a small heist uh, I don't. I'm not sure if he gained any experience, though. It might uh, the bar might only show up uh, later on. But anyway, that's the first thing. Then there's clan contracts. Now you do have a significant upkeep or a significant recruitment cost for non eshin units, but you also have the four main clans that are going to give you contracts that will reduce that and even even give you a discount if you get to exalted reputation with them as well as a major diplomatic bonus as well as faction bonuses over with clan molder for instance you get the construction cost and recruitment cost benefit for at ogres help and help at abominations for clan moors for uh, recruitment cost for clan rats and storm vermin because clan rectus does not get to uh claim the storm vermins as well as control and weapon strength um for clan scariah you get uh, armor for lords and embedded heroes, research rate and recruitment cost benefits to Doom Flayers, Warp Lightning, Doom Wheels, and Skaven Weapon Teams, and then finally for Clan Pestilin, a food benefit uh, and um, discount. And you do get various missions because you're the assassins, you're the spies and assassins of the Skaven, and everyone wants to use you in their, uh, in their deals. So you not only have a campaign, a regular campaign, but you're also dealing with all of these actions and engaging with diplomacy with, um, or dealings with other Skaven clans. You can lose reputation. You also get, uh, if we look at the diplomatic tree, you also get to see where all of these uh, Skaven clans, the major ones, are. Now, they're unlikely to be wiped out. Clan Mulder maybe is at risk if Keyscliff does well. But you may end up being able to confederate all of these various clans and gaining a foothold across the map if you do so. Like, if you maintain good diplomatic relations with them, which is certainly possible through, uh, through these various actions. So, is certainly a nice campaign. There's a lot to like about it, and... Snitch is the best legendary lord of the Skaven. And you really do feel like playing an assassin uh, legendary lord through through these actions. It may not be as complex, so to speak, as some other stuff that is available, but yeah, what is available is nice. And finally, at number one, in terms of the most unique and interesting campaigns in Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires, we have Oxyatl. Now, I generally don't care that much about Lizardmen. I find them pretty dull. 
uh, to play in terms of like battle and campaign gameplay style. They're an okay spot, they're a fine race, they're just not that compelling. They're okay. Uh, out of all the default races, I say they're in a pretty decent spot, but yeah, there's some things like the High Elves that are better in that respect. An okay spot, nothing, no major glaring problems with the way their campaign works, just nothing too exciting either. But here's the thing. What makes Axiatl special? Well, you start in the Southern Cast Wastes. There are only minor demonic factions across the Southern Cast Wastes that you will be able to smash your way through with ease. Axiatl fo focuses, as opposed to the big lizards, he focuses on the small lizards. And he's more of an ambush style uh, hero or legendary lord. He's focusing on ambushes, mobility, etc. He certainly plays very differently in battles than most other people. And he has benefits to skinks and chameleon skinks. Okay, that's one thing. But you're, you might think, oh, this campaign is going to be really boring because you start in the south, you don't have major factions, you're going to be able to expand across a good amount of territory, take out all of this Tagal Fangavor, take out all of this, and then go either in Lustria or in the deep south, in the southlands. That is true if you only view it from that perspective. However, Oxyatl does have a lot more to it than that. First off, he can build Silent Sanctums, right? Uh, and he can build a structure in one of these Sanctums that will allow you to teleport. So if I bring the uh, bring, bring the visions of the old ones, you can see like I can just click this button and Oxyatl will teleport there instantly. You can only have one of these at the time, one of these teleport pads, uh, so to speak, at the time. And it's only Oxyatl's army. So making a really powerful army for him is actually the best way to play him. You can have other ar armies, of course, but if you want to make a large empire as Oxyatl, just use this, take advantage of this, get gems for the uh, Silent Sanctums, and spread across the world or the regions you can see. But that's just part of it. The other thing are the visions of the old ones. What will happen here is that you're going to get a bunch of random events. You'll gain certain bonuses if you do them, and downsides if you don't. So for instance, if I don't deal with uh, this particular settlement, if I don't raise or conquer this particular settlement, I'm gonna get Chaos on Divided Corruption plus 10 in all provinces. And there are a variety of challenges. This one is easy, this one is normal, and this one is hard. And so you get missions across the entire world to deal with, and you gain some fairly solid bonuses if you do it, like this one is easy, would just give me some melee attacks, some gems though. However, it would be nice. And diplomatic relations with lizardmen. Like if you do these missions, you get diplomatic relations with lizardmen, which can allow you to confederate lizardmen factions. So for instance, if I look at the cult of Sotek here, um, you do gain just a tiny amount of like, I think it's ruler's tolerance, like it's just free. If I do more of these missions, I'll get more. But these missions can vary in terms of difficulty. This one right here is pretty damn hard because it is an army of Keeper of Secrets and Soul Grinders of Slanesh. This is an endgame army that spawned on turn 12. That is quite something. I don't think it's a threat. I don't think that I am at risk here. But if I go and try and fight this, you see, I would get a Valiant defeat. You may be able to win it in some way, shape, or form. Maybe if I recruited more units or... Uh, lower the difficulty, or oddly enough, if I do something like this, right? Like if I send Oxyatl there, uh, he'll lose, but if I send this fellow right here, we'll win. Yeah, it, it can be a bit weird. Anyway, so I've gotten that, dealt with a pretty hardcore army over there, and then I look at the diplomatic relations over here. Yeah, I gained three, so it's free per small diplomatic relation. And you get these missions across the entire world. So I have two in the north, but you can get one in the Southlands, you can get some in Austria, you can get in the Empire, wherever. It's generally aimed at chaos. I, actually, I think they're all aimed at uh, dealing with chaos, pretty much. So you're not just fighting a campaign where you are, oh, I'm just in my nice little corner and I'm just gonna deal with that. No, you teleport around the world. Now, there are other people who can do that. Bellacor, Scarbrand himself can do that through a cult. Uh, if a region has a great deal of corn corruption, a cult may spawn and you can take advantage of that. But Axiotl by default, and as part of a core gameplay mechanic, is going to be doing this. 
And that's what makes it so interesting, because you have a great, because you're, because regardless of how you play, regardless of where you decide to expand, you are going to be fighting across the whole, um, the whole of the world. And you're really going to have a fairly dynamic campaign because the events, uh, I mean, sure, there are certain events that can pop up. I think they're the most common one that's going to happen is that uh, you're going to have a really powerful army in your initial province uh, uh, appearing. I've seen that happen several times, but outside of that, the events are random. So you get a random challenge, which makes the campaign in itself incredibly dynamic and a great deal of fun because you're not doing the same thing over and over again. The only things that you're doing the same uh, same thing over and over again are the easy stuff, like just conquering this province. It's an incre incredibly easy faction to play when you're looking at the perspective of like, oh, just initial conquest. But when you factor in the events, these visions that you want to do, for the various bonuses, uh, then, yeah, it can be a lot of fun. Now, some people would say, oh, it's too easy. Like Mandalore, in his review of this DLC, when it was introduced in Warhammer 2, he said he believed that it was too easy. Well, I don't think it's too easy right now, at least not the hard, hard challenges, but the consequences are not necessarily too bad. But I don't necessarily think the consequences should be too harsh if you ignore these. Um, I think... Players are going to be incentivized anyway to do them because of some of the penalties. And they're going to be incentivized because of the benefits, the income benefits, the blessed units. Like, I got, got the blessed Carnosaur. It's pretty expensive, <laughs> absolutely. But I got some pretty good stuff uh, out of doing that. And so, you are fighting across the world. You can only teleport with Oxyotl's army, so you really need to focus on him. But it's one of those campaigns where if you focus uh, where you want to focus on the army of your legendary lord more so than anything else as opposed to how many other factions pretty much need to play if they want to win they need to focus on large armies a lot of armies and that's how they generally end up doing very well i mean you still need to occupy loot to raise or sack a lot of settlements but you get instant teleportation when you get one of the objectives oh i'm teleporting in northern cast wastes i'm gonna bring some troops raise some settlements and come towards the objective and then i'm gonna bug I'm gonna get the hell out of there. It is a genuinely fun, interesting, and unique campaign that doesn't compare honestly with anything else that exists currently in the game. And that's all there is to it. Costine signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, enable notifications, and I'll see you boys and girls next time.